Hi. Whoa, too loud. So um, I realize I'm the last person between you guys and the bar. So I'm really impressed that you're still here. Um, there's been some amazing talks today. I've seen a lot of them. There's some amazing talks going on right now. So thanks a lot for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to Ruby Central. I don't know if any of you guys are in the room. Um, for giving me the chance to talk at RubyConf. It's like a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm really excited. Uh, it's, it's thrilling for me to be here. So thanks a lot. Um, my name is Pat Shaughnessy, and I'm going to be talking about blocks. So that's right. I'm going to talk for 45 minutes about Ruby blocks. And in fact, together, we're going to be dissecting a Ruby block. So don't worry. There'll be no blood, no gore, uh, no lab animals will be harmed in this uh, experiment. Uh, what, what I'm going to do is look at how Ruby implements blocks internally and see what we can learn about blocks by doing that. And I'll be talking about uh, Matt's Ruby implementation today, not about JRuby, Rubinius, uh, other versions of Ruby. Um, before I get into blocks, uh, let me just start by saying a little bit about myself. You probably haven't heard of me before. I work at a company called McKinsey, which is a management consulting firm. But I'm not a consultant. I just, I'm just a Ruby developer. I write code for them. Um, in my spare time, I write a blog about Ruby development at patshaughnessy.net. Uh, and I'm really excited. I actually just finished my first book. I wrote a book. Um, I've been working for the last, hey, thank you. So I just released a book uh, this week on Monday called Ruby Under a Microscope. And it's all about uh, Ruby internals. So I've taken six months off from my, my job. And I went uh, into my, just sat at my house, and I wrote about how Ruby works. And the way, I, the way I like to think of it is I went on a long road trip. It was kind of like visiting Japan or a foreign country where you don't really know the language. And you're seeing all these amazing exotic sites. And you're, um, you know, but you begin to learn a little bit of the local language. You get to know people there. And you can kind of appreciate their customs and their food. And that's what it was like for me. So the book is sort of a travel journal about uh, Ruby MRI internals. I also touch on JRuby and Rubinius in the book. Um, so if you're into uh, internal stuff, and, uh, and actually, the presentation today, this is really a synopsis of one of the chapters from the book. Uh, please check it out. Um, so the first question you probably have for me is, OK, Pat, why Ruby internals? Who cares about how Ruby works? All I care about is that Ruby does what it's supposed to do. You know, if I take a value, if I insert something into a hash, or if I save it into an array, all I need to know is that I'm going to get it back when I give it the same key. Um, I, I, I don't care how Ruby works. I'm busy. I have a day job. I have to get stuff done. I have to, um, you know, maybe I have an open source project at night I work on in my spare time or on the weekends. You know, who has time to look into Ruby internals and figure it out? You know, I took six months off and I did it. I'm kind of crazy, maybe. But um, here are the reasons why I did it and maybe why you should learn about Ruby internals, too. So I can think of three reasons. Um, the first one is I think if you study Ruby internals, it can help you become a better Ruby developer. So I think you can learn about the language more deeply than you may have uh, you can learn it more deeply than you did before. Um, you can learn about how Ruby was intended to be used, how Matt's and the rest of the core team intended the language to be used, not just use it the way that you happen to learn how to use it. Um, and um, I think you can learn a lot and just become a better developer for it. Um, maybe a second reason could be there's a lot to learn from the core team. You know, the Koichi and the other team, people on team, are, they're really smart people. They've solved difficult problems. And maybe you can learn from their solutions, their algorithm, their code and learn about, you know, maybe pull some ideas from them that you can try on your own projects. Um, so there's a lot of amazing solutions in there that we can all learn from. Um, and it's a little inaccessible unless you take the time to learn it. Um, and I think the last reason, the most important one, is just a lot of fun. I had a blast. I had so much fun learning about Ruby internals. And I hope you guys um, get a little taste of that today. If you, if you like it, then check out the book. There's a lot of really amazing stuff going on in there. It's fascinating to me to learn how a language works internally. You know, I never knew this. I'm not a computer science major or anything. And so for me to learn about how language worked internally, it was just, it was just super fun. So that's the most important reason, have fun. Um, so today I'm going to talk about blocks. You know, here's a block, and um, it seems kind of hard to believe that there's really that much interesting to say about blocks. You know, what can we say about them? Well, we can call them. You can call a block. You can pass in an argument to a block like this. Um, and you know, most of us, especially here at RubyConf, you can, all you guys can tell me how this, you know, what this code will do in two seconds or less. You can tell me what this code is going to do. You know, what am I possibly going to say? What can we say about blocks that's that interesting? Um, so hold that thought. Well, I'll get to the blocks in a second. The real reason, however, I want to talk about blocks is um, when I think back to when I first came across Ruby, and I imagine a lot of you here had the same experience. 
you know, you first saw Ruby, for me it was in 2008 maybe, and before that I was a PHP, uh, Java, C++ developer, I did a few other random things too. Um, you know, so if I wanted to write code that did this in C, I would have to say, you know, int i semicolon uh, four parentheses i equals zero semicolon i less than 10 semicolon i plus plus parentheses brace, blah, 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 blah. It was a much more verbose way of doing the same thing. And when I first came across this, it might, it might have been 2008, I thought to myself, wow, this is something different. I haven't seen anything like this before. Um, you know, it, was, it seemed really elegant and beautiful to me. And it got me to think twice about Ruby. I thought to myself, Ruby is something special. And when I think back about that, it, it really was the blocks, the way that you can use blocks in Ruby that got me to fall in love with the language. So, you know, aside from all the technical stuff which we're about to go into, for me, the real reason I wanted to talk to, to you guys today about blocks was it's what I like the most about Ruby. Uh, and, you know, think back to your own history where you discovered the language and what it was about Ruby that made you fall in love with it enough to come to RubyConf. So for me, it was blocks. So what am I going to say about blocks? Well, the first thing I want to do is define what is a block. You know, if we ask that question, what is a block, what kind of answer do we get? You know, and so the way I want to do that is if, imagine if I could slice open a block and look inside. You know, what's inside of a block? Are there moving parts in there? Am I going to see blood, guts, chromosomes, you know, amoebas? If I were to slice a piece of a block at, look it under, look at it under a microscope, you know, what would I see? Um, and so the first half of the presentation, I'm going to talk about um, what blocks are. I'm going to answer that question, what is a block? Uh, and we'll find out in a few minutes um, that blocks are Ruby's implementation of closures. And we'll define what a closure is along the way. Uh, and then at the second half, I'm going to switch gears and talk about closures and metaprogramming and how those two things are related. So two different, very different concepts, but I think they're actually related to each other. And so um, we'll talk about that second. So let's get into it. So if you were to look inside the Ruby C source code and you were to try to figure something out about what blocks are, the first thing that you would see is that there's a C memory structure called RB underscore block. Uh, and I'm not showing the contents of it here. And the reason why is I want to sort of discover as we go along what's in this structure. Um, and but the nice thing about studying Ruby internals is if you had a question like this, you know, what is a block or what is an object, what is a module, you know, you can actually directly answer that. All you need to do is go into the C code, find the definition of this or that or the other thing, and that's your answer. You know, you don't have to think about it very much. You can just look at how it was implemented. And so that's another, maybe another reason for studying Ruby internals is you can answer all these sorts of questions that you might have about how the language works or how it was intended to be used. So before we go any farther, a word about my diagrams, uh, you know, today and also in my ebook, I have a lot of pictures. It's like an illustrated book. Um, my pictures are not definitive, exhaustive definitions of exactly how Ruby works. I'm not going to show you every single thing inside the block structure. Um, and there's, uh, the reason why is I want to point out to you the details about Ruby internals that I think are important for, for you, for Ruby developers, to know. Um, there's a lot of other very technical things and a lot of nitty-gritty details that maybe aren't as interesting. And so I'm going to gloss over or ignore some of those details. And so my diagrams are oversimplified versions of reality. So that'll make them hopefully easier for you to understand as well. Uh, it made it easier for me to draw them too. So um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do a series of experiments. And the reason I called the book Ruby Under a Microscope is I wanted to use sort of a scientific method for discovering and learning things about Ruby. You know, it's one thing to just start talking about how it works and what it does. It's another thing to test your hypothesis with an experiment. Um, so I'm not going to do real experiments today. I'm just going to do, a, you know, a few simple thought experiments. I wouldn't have much time. But in the book, I go into more detail about um, one thing or another and actually run some code. The experiments are written in Ruby code, so you can download them and run them yourself if you're interested. So the first thing we're going to do is really the most uh, basic thing you can do with a block is call a block. So how do we call a block? So not rocket science, all of you know how to call a block. Here's an example. Um, here's a block that takes a, a string value, the quick brown fox. The rest of that, of course, is jumps over the lazy dog. That didn't fit on the slide. But we're going to come back to that string over and over again, and you're going to get very bored and tired of hearing me say that. Um, and we're going to save it in a string uh, variable, called, uh, a local variable called str, and then we're going to print that out, and we'll do that 10 times. So not very interesting code. But it, what it does is it allows me to answer the question, what is a block? And so the first and most obvious answer to that question is, well, it's right there on the screen. It's everything between the do keyword and the end keyword. 
you know, the first most obvious definition of a block is it's just a code snippet. It's something that, um, you know, it's code that you type in. It's sort of like a function. If we were to look inside of Ruby, you know, through a microscope, so to speak, this is what you would see. So that RB block C structure, I'm showing that on the right, and now I'm showing you one of the fields or one of the values inside that, uh, and there are many more, but here's one of them. It's called ISEQ, and I think, and you know, help me out here, core team, I think that stands for instruction sequence. And that's a pointer, and it points to an instruction sequence. That's what I'm showing on the left side. Um, yeah, and an instruction sequence is a series of bytecode or virtual machine instructions. The first one is put string, set dynamic, et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry, don't try to read that, don't try to understand it. I'm not gonna explain any of that today. It, uh, I have a lot more of that in my book. Um, but what I wanted to point out is, this is really what a block is. It's a snippet of code and internally this is what it looks like. Um, just taking a step back for a moment, I will say just one, uh, you know, maybe one minute about how uh, the virtual machine works and how these bytecode instructions work. At a 10,000 foot level, when you look at Ruby from, you know, from a distance, the way Ruby works, at least starting with Ruby 1.9, is you give it some of your code, Ruby parses that and compiles your Ruby code into these instructions, and then it executes them with a virtual machine. And that's what uh, Koichi was talking about earlier today. So, um, so anyway, this is our first answer to the question, what is a block? It's a, uh, it's a snippet of code or a function. Um, now let's do another experiment. This time I wanna um, look at how you can reference variables from the parent scope. And that sounds kind of complicated, but it's really actually obvious. So if you were to look at a block like this, so now I'm doing the same thing, I'm putting the same string out 10 times, I'm just doing it in a more complicated, silly fashion. Uh, and so what I've done here is I've taken the first half of the string, the quick round fox, and I've saved that in the same str variable. But I'm, I'm doing that in the outer scope. Um, then I call the block 10 times, and in the block I say str2, so I have a second variable, uh, and on that one I'm saving the second half of the string. Jumps over the lazy dog. And then I have a put s statement that says put s, you know, string and string two. So pretty simple code, you can all understand this. Um, and in fact, you know, what's so interesting about this? This is all kind of obvious. All you guys write this, this sort of code probably every day. This is probably a reflex. You probably just type this in without even realizing it. Um, you know, why am I pointing this out to you? Well, for me, there's something actually kind of profound and interesting going on here. It has to do with the question, again, what is a block? So the way I look at it is, blocks have kind of this dual personality. They're kind of schizophrenic. You know, they have, on the one hand, they're a separate function that I'm calling. On the other hand, they're part of the surrounding function. And so that put s statement can access equally well, it can access str, and it can access str2. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, and that's kind of obvious. We all take that for granted, but it's not, you know, don't take it for granted. A lot goes on inside of Ruby to make that work. So let's take a look inside of Ruby and see how that's implemented. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step through this slowly, and I'm gonna go through this in great detail and explain how this is implemented. So the first thing we do is we take that string, the fox string, and we save it in a variable, str. So what does Ruby do when you save a value in a variable? So if we were to look inside of Ruby, um, again, you can tell these are super oversimplified diagrams, but what I'm trying to get across here are the essential ideas. So um, first of all, on the left we have a stack. This is something called uh, the virtual machine's internal stack. So the way the virtual machine works, uh, and if you heard the, the presentation earlier, you know this, it's a stack-based machine. As it runs those instructions that we saw earlier, um, set local, get local, whatever, as it runs those internal instructions, those instructions typically use, uh, they take values off of this internal stack, they do some kind of operation, and they push the result back on the stack. Um, so this internal stack is actually not something that you ever see as a Ruby developer or really need to know much about. Um, but you know, just remember that, that the virtual machine inside of Ruby is a stack-based machine. And so when we save a value in a local variable, like str in this example, that value gets saved on that stack internally. Okay, on the right is actually a different stack. So on the right, there's something called the RB control frame structure, and I'm showing one member from that structure. And Kuichi asked earlier, you know, how many members are in this? And I think there were 11. So there's a lot more going on here I'm not showing you. But I, what I wanted to point out is that there's one pointer, the DFP, which I think stands for dynamic frame pointer, that indicates that Ruby uses the keep track of where the variables are for the, current, um, for the current scope. So what I need to explain here is that as your Ruby program runs and you call from one method to another, to a block, to a lambda, uh, 
you have this Ruby call stack that you build up. And if you ever run the command put s caller, that will print out that whole call stack. And so each level in that call stack is represented by this RB control frame structure. Um, and so what you have to imagine here is, and I don't really have time to explain all this today, is that there's a stack or an array of these control frames that represent your Ruby call stack. So if you think about it, inside of Ruby there are two stacks. There's the Ruby stack on the right, and there's the internal virtual machine stack on the left. And those two things are related and connected. Anyway, let's get back to block. So how does this work? So now we've saved a value in str, and now we're going to call the block. So what happens? Well, actually, we're not calling the block, are we? What are we doing here? What we're doing here is we're taking a number, 10, and we're considering that to be an object. That's the receiver of a message. So 10 is an instance of the fixed num or integer class. And we're sending a message to it, which is the times method. So what we're doing is we're calling the times method on that class uh, fixed num. And that has nothing to do with the block. In fact, we're not calling the block at all. What we're doing is we're, we're taking that block and we're passing it into the method as an argument. So it's, um, there's more going on here than you might think. So let's look at what happens inside of Ruby at the moment when you pass a block into a method call as an argument. So again, we're not calling the, calling the block yet. We're simply referring to that block for the first time. So when you do that, when you, when you first refer to or use a block, Ruby says, oh, I have a new block. I need to create a new RB block structure. And so what it does, and again, I'm um, showing an over, oversimplified version of the same structure, but it creates a second value in there, and it copies it, the DFP, it copies it from the control frame to the block, okay? So remember that DFP, that was a pointer over to the internal stack where the local variables for that method were stored. So what's going on here is interesting, is that it, Ruby is saving information inside the block about where you first referred to that block from, where you um, decided to pass it into a method. So blocks are not as simple as they seem. They're not just a code snippet. They have this other value inside of them, which is a uh, pointer to the environment where you uh, reference them from. So interesting. Um, let's hold on to that thought for a minute and see where we, where we go. OK, so now we're calling uh, the 10.times method. So we're calling into the times method inside the fixed num class. And so whenever you call a method in Ruby, it creates another stack frame on that internal stack. It pushes a bunch of values on there, and there's a lot of details I'm not showing. But I just want to get across the fact that as you call deeper and deeper into your code, it creates more and more of these stack frames. Uh, and now this fixed num times class, this is implemented in C. This is not something that you write yourself. Um, but it works the same way that you probably would write it. It loops over you know, the number 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. So in this case, we'll go up to 9. And finally, now it's time to call the block. So that, will, that code inside of the fixed num class will yield to the block. Yield is just a fancy word to use for calling uh, the block function. Um, and, uh, and it'll also pass in that integer argument if you want to, if you want it to. OK, so now I'm in the block. I'm going to create that str2 variable where I save jumps over the lazy dog. And, uh, and then I'll print out the two strings. So let's see how that works. OK, so now I'm um, getting a little more complicated. In my internal stack, my yarv internal stack, now I have three stack frames. In fact, there's more than three. I'm glossing that over, too. There's a fourth stack frame in there. But just to keep things simple today, on the bottom, we have the parent scope, where the str variable was. In the middle, we have another scope for the times method. Uh, and then on the top, we have the top of the stack is now being used as we run the code inside the block. And so that's where the str2 variable goes. And so the put s call, when it says put s, str, str2, the code in put s is able to access both str2 in the current scope, and then using that DFP pointer can go down to the parent scope farther down on the stack and find that str variable. And the reason it can do that is that when you yield to a block in Ruby, when you call a block, Ruby takes that DFP pointer out of the block and puts it onto the stack so that your, all the code inside your block is able to access the environment where you originally, again, where you first referred to that block. So Ruby is in that way sort of merging those two things together, the original surrounding environment and the current scope of uh, the block itself. So that's, uh, you know, back to that dual personality, that's the way blocks are able to behave in this way, how they're smart enough to do both things. Um, so just taking a step back and reviewing, we found uh, so far we've discovered two, two fields or values inside the block structure. We have the ISEQ pointer, this is the instruction sequence. 
That points over to the, again, a series of bytecode instructions that the virtual machine is going to run. So this is the compiled version of my function. And then it has that dynamic frame pointer, or DFP, that points down to the stack. And again, not to where the stack is, uh, you know, at the moment we run the code, but to the referencing environment where I first referred to that stack, uh, to that block. So it turns out in computer science, there's a fancy name for this combination of two ideas, a function and the environment where you refer to that function from. Uh, and that was invented a long time ago, back in 1975. I don't know if that's off the edge of the slide. So back in 1975, uh, an MIT professor named Gerald Sussman uh, and his colleague Guy Seal wrote a paper called Scheme, an, extended, uh, an interpreter for extended lambda calculus. Sounds really complicated, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty uh, hardcore academic paper. It's actually all online. You can download this and read it yourself. I, d I did the other day. It was really fun. Um, I love this stuff. I'm kind of a language geek. Um, and this paper defined and, and, and explained their implementation of a language called Scheme. Scheme is a dialect of Lisp. Uh, and what's interesting about Scheme, and Scheme is still being used today, uh, is that it was the first time that in computer science there was a formal definition of the word closure. So they define inside this, um, this academic paper what a closure is, and here's how they defined it. So we'll just read through this for a second. In order to solve this problem, and I don't remember what problem they were solving, um, we introduced the notion of a closure, uh, which is a data structure containing a lambda expression, whatever that is, and an environment to be used when that lambda expression is applied to its argument. So kind of you know, you know, convoluted language here. A lambda expression, that's a fancy way of saying a function or a method, and um, applying that lambda expression to its arguments just means to call the function and pass in the arguments. But if you think about this for a minute, this is actually what we have in Ruby with a block. We have a function and an environment to be used when we call a function. You know, backing up, this is what a block is. It's the function on the top left and then the environment on the lower left. And so, uh, and so what we've done here is we've shown that blocks in Ruby are, uh, are they're Ruby's implementation of closures. So Ruby has taken, and I don't know if Matt did this on purpose or you know, indirectly, but Ruby's taken um, a concept from the 1970s and applied it to a language that was invented in the 1990s and that we're still using today. So I find that kind of interesting. Um, so let's move on and talk about lambdas. So lambdas are related to blocks and let's see if we could do an experiment and figure out you know, what lambdas are. Um, but before we get to the lambdas themselves, you know, where does the word lambda come from? You know, why in the world does Ruby have a keyword that is a Greek letter? You know, lambda is a, a letter in the Greek alphabet. What does it have to do with computer science? Um, so it turns out the same thing, that Ruby borrowed the idea of lambda, or the word lambda, from Lisp. This is the first computer that ever ran uh, the Lisp language. This is from the early 1960s. Lisp was invented by John McCarthy in the late 1950s, actually. So this is, what is that, almost um, 50 years ago now? Uh, and uh, in Lisp, John McCarthy introduced the idea of a lambda, which is a way, and so here's in Lisp how you would create an anonymous function. I'm not a Lisp developer, and many of you here might be, um, but what I think this is doing is, it's defining a function, there's a lot of parentheses in Lisp, but what I think it's doing is it's defining a function that takes the argument and then divides that argument by two and returns that value. So it's, uh, but it's not doing that immediately, it's returning a function as a value. And so what Lisp introduced, and other functional programming languages do this too, they allow you to treat code or functions as data values, uh, and so they, you know, quote unquote, they treat code as a first class citizen. So in Ruby, you can do the same thing. Ruby borrowed the lambda keyword from Lisp. And um, here's, uh, you know, here's my same silly example. Um, now I'm doing it in, in an even more complicated and confusing manner. So what I wanna do is demonstrate how you use lambda in Ruby. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna print out the same string, um, not 10 times, just one time today. Uh, well, for this experiment. So how does this work? So a lot of you guys might know exactly how lambdas work, um, but in case some of you don't or haven't used one in a while, let me go through it. So the way this works is on the bottom I call a method, display message. It calls into the method. In the method we save the quick brown fox, the first half of the string in a variable, str, same thing we did earlier. And then we have a block that takes um, the first half of the string and prints it out concatenated with the second half of the string. Except the difference here is I don't call the block immediately, instead I say lambda. And what lambda does is it returns that block as a value. It converts it into a, ta a data value of some kind. And that becomes, since this is the last thing in the display message method, 
that becomes the return value for that method. And then finally we say dot call at the very bottom. So it's not until the bottom here where I say dot call that it prints out the full string. And you can try this on your own computers. So um, let's go through this and see how this is implemented inside of Ruby. You know, what goes on when you, when you use Lambda? So we'll go through it one line at a time slowly. The first thing is I take the fox string and I put it in the str variable. So same story here, um, you know, no, no surprise. We save the string on the stack and there's a control frame structure. Um, and the bottom empty one is the outside scope and then we have one for the message uh, for that, in, that method that we're calling, which should be display message. Um, okay, what do we do next? So now we call lambda. So what happens inside of Ruby when you call the lambda keyword? So it's gonna be a complicated diagram, don't panic. I'm gonna go through this slowly. Let's see if we can figure this out together. Um, and let me take a couple minutes to just explain this picture. So before I get to all the boxes and arrows on the right, let me talk about the two words on the left, stack and heap. So what I'm indicating there is there's really two different types of memory in your Ruby process, or really in any process for that matter. There's stack memory, that's what we've been talking about so far, where you push values onto a stack and you pop them off. The stack is used for values that are very temporary in nature. So they're only valid or they're only needed for a short period of time, usually during the context of one method or function. On the, on the bottom, under the dotted line, we have the heap. And a lot of you may know the heap is for, where, is for when you want to save things for a long period of time. You know, when you um, want some value to persist around or, or you know, to lie around for a while so you can use it later. Uh, and the biggest or most obvious example of using the heap in a Ruby program is when you create an object, it gets saved in the heap. It, uh, Ruby allocates the memory out of the heap and uses it for that object. So what's going on here? When I call lambda, what does it do? Well, the first thing it does, let's start from the top left. It takes that internal stack where we have that str variable, and it copies it from the stack, it copies that stack frame down into the heap. So it creates a persistent sort of, um, a, a new second copy of all the same information. But what's special about that is it's now in the heap so it can persist for a longer period of time. Um, and the other thing Ruby does, it creates on the bottom, and I don't, I don't know if everyone can see this, some of you are pretty far back, there's a structure called rb underscore env. Uh, and this is a, uh, what's called the environment object, I, I assume. And this is a sort of a structure that Ruby uses to manage that heap copy of the stack. Um, so interesting, what else is going on here? The other thing that Ruby does on the right is it takes the control frame structure and it copies it into something called an RB underscore prox structure. And as you might know, some of you, the return value of a lambda, key, uh, the lambda keyword is actually a proc object. And so this is Ruby's internal representation of a proc. And you can see it puts in there the DFT pointer, the ISEQ pointer, and a couple other things. Um, and one interesting detail to notice here is that inside the proc structure is a block structure. Uh, and so in fact, what, we, what we're seeing here by looking at the way the, these things are implemented is that procs and lambdas and blocks, they're all really the same thing. They're all closures. They're all that combination of the ISEQ pointer, the code or the function, and the DFT pointer, which is the referencing environment. So they're all really different ways of looking at the same thing. And so when you call lambda, it creates that new object, it copies the stack frame or that environment into the heap, and then it, um, uh, and then it returns that proc to you as a, as a return value. Okay, so finally we're ready to print out the string. And we're ready to say display message.call, and it's gonna print out the string, it'll work just fine. But what I wanted to point out here is something interesting, which is um, if you look at this carefully and think about it, how is it possible that when I call dot call at the bottom, it prints out the whole string. If you look at that first variable, str, that's a local variable inside a method. Normally when a method returns, all the variables that you create in a method are, you know, they're free, they're released, they're gone forever. But obviously here, that str variable lives on. It's got sort of a second lease on life and it's able to do more, you know, more good for you, do more in your program. How does that work? Well, that's really back up to this picture. That's the whole reason why Ruby is doing all this work, all this copying, all these new structures and pointers. All this is just so that you can continue to refer to the environment where you called Lambda from. So at the moment I call Lambda, that environment, not only what's inside the Lambda, but the surrounding values are all saved away so that later when I say dot call, it works fine. Uh, and looking at how that's implemented inside of Ruby, um, it's sort of a similar picture, except the opposite. So what we do now is Ruby takes the DFT pointer from the block that's inside that proc 
and it copies it up into a new stack frame that it sets up to run the code inside the block. And remember, in the block, we're creating str2, that's the dog part of the string. So that is pushed onto the stack now on the top left, and it saves that GFC pointer there, which points, now it points out to the heap where the referencing environment or that, you know, copy of the reference of that environment is saved. So it's just like calling a normal block, except for that detail, the GFP is now pointing out to the heap. So that's how lambdas work. Um, so let's move on. That's enough about blocks, and uh, we've seen how blocks and lambdas and procs are all the same thing, and they're all, um, in, they're all closures. Um, now let's shift gears and talk about closures and metaprogramming. So two different, very, very different ideas. How are they related? And, you know, what does metaprogramming have to do with closures? So first of all, um, so let's do an experiment using a closure to define a method. So what in the world does that mean? Um, so let's take another example. Let's say I create a, now I'm going to wrap my exciting um, fox dog string. I'm going to wrap it up in a class. So I'm going to create a class called quote. And um, you all know how to create methods. What you do is you say class, the name of a class, quote, and you say def this, def that, def the other thing. You just start typing in method definitions and use the def keyword, D-E-F. All very obvious. So how do you do metaprogramming? What is metaprogramming? Well, one way of doing metaprogramming in Ruby is to dynamically create methods. And all that means is, instead of saying def, D-E-F, I can say define method, display message. So the only difference between this, what you normally do, and this, the define method met method, is that you pass the name of the, met uh, the new method as a parameter to it. So the name of my new method, uh, my new method is display message. I should have thought of a different example that wasn't a tongue twister. So here I am defining a method in a more confusing, convoluted manner that doesn't make as much sense. That's what metaprogramming really is all about, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, but you know, in a real example, what you would do is you would probably have a loop here. You might create 10 or 20 methods all at the same time. You're going through the, you know, each name, each method's name is maybe in an array, or maybe the name of the method is from user input or from a database query. So there might be some really valid reasons for doing something like this. But what I want to point out here is something different. I think there's actually some, there's another minor detail here you may not have noticed that's different between this and this, which is that when you say define method and you pass in the, the name, then you have to say do end. So the, the, the method's body is actually a block. You're passing a block into this define method method. And that's not what we did over here. We just said def, the name, and then we started typing in the code. And remember, blocks are closures. So because the block is a closure, it means that the code inside of the block can access things in its surrounding environment. Now, in this example, there really is nothing interesting around that. There's no, there's no reason to do this. Well, imagine if in your, in your Ruby application there was an interesting environment. There was a place in your code where you had a lot of interesting values you wanted your new method to be aware of and to have access to. So I'll make up a contrived example. Let's say I only remember to put the, the fox, the first half of the string, in the, in the instance variable at str. But then I discovered later, oh, I have the dog, the, the second half of the string, str2, somewhere else in my code. You know, how can, I, how can I allow my exciting method to print out the same thing, both strings together? Well, since it's a closure, it's able to access the um, instance variable, since it's gonna become a method of this quote class, it's able to access equally well at str on the top and str2, which is um, in the surrounding uh, scope there. One confusing detail here, here is I have to say quote.send define method. That's because the define method um, method is, a, is private to the module class. But other than that, it's actually not that complicated. So this is how you can define a method using a closure. Okay, let's take another example. Um, let's look at sort of the classic example of metaprogramming. So metaprogramming really means to write code that writes code. And in Ruby, um, the simplest way to do that is to say, uh, is to use the eval function. If I create a string like put s two plus two, uh, again, this is silly, but you can imagine uh, a real example where you're dynamically writing code that based on some kind of data you're getting from somewhere. Um, you can pass that string into eval, and what it will do is it will recursively call that virtual machine again and um, compile that code into those bytecode instructions and then run them. Uh, and so in this case, it'll print out four, so not really interesting. But one, one detail about eval that maybe you didn't know is that it's also a closure. So the code inside of this string can access the environment around the call to eval. So what does that mean and how does that work? Well, another way of doing this is to use the binding keyword. 
This allows you to formally specify that environment that you want the eval to work with. Um, so, so imagine for a minute, I went back to my quote class and I said def get binding. So I create a method called get binding. And the reason I want to do that, you'll see in a minute, the reason I want to do that is to be able to access the scope or the environment inside of this class. Um, so, well, so I can access that at str variable. So hold that thought, let's move on and look at um, creating a new instance of the quote class. So I'll say object equals quote dot new. So now I have a new object. Um, what I want to do is, um, so let me take a moment and explain just for, for 10 seconds or less how Ruby implements objects. And I have a lot more about this in my book. Um, there's a, um, a lot more detail, a whole chapter on objects. But in a nutshell, whenever you create an object, Ruby creates a structure called our object, at least for custom objects that you write. You know, for strings and arrays, there's something else. Um, but one of the other details I didn't show in that control frame structure is that there is another thing called the self pointer that points to the current value of self, so the object in which you're running uh, at the moment. So all of you are probably familiar with self, but if not, just imagine that as you go through your Ruby call stack and you call one method, calls another, calls another, each one of those methods belongs to some object, some instance of some class. And so the way Ruby implements that is in this control frame structure, and there's one of these for each level in your Ruby call stack, there's a self pointer that points to um, which instance, uh, which object instance is currently the, self, the current value of self. Um, the R object um, structure itself has some other things in it, but the most important its two values are there's a class with a K, that's the class pointer that will point out to indicate which class this object is instance of. And then there's another thing called IVPTR, or the instance variable pointer, and this points to an array of the instance variables for this object. Um, so in this case, we're going to have at str in that, in that array. Okay, so back to our example. Now we know something about how objects work internally. And I've created an object, obj equals quote dot new. And now I call eval. And what I want to have happen, and this, of course, this will work. You can try this if you really want to. But what I want to do here is allow the compiler, when it compiles that string, to compile it in the context of the obj object. And so the way you can do that in, with the eval method is you can pass in a second parameter, which is that binding. And remember, we got that, so we're saying obj dot get binding. So backing up to my uh, class, at the bottom we have that, that method that we saw earlier, get binding. And that just calls this special, um, this mysterious keyword binding. And what does that do? And what happens at the moment I call binding? And what is a binding anyway? Um, so, well, we can see what it's intended to do. It's going to tell eval, when you compile that code, do it in the context of this binding. And that binding can be anywhere in your application. And so how does that work? What happens inside of Ruby when I say binding? Well, let's take a look. Um, so this is a sort of a similar picture to what we had earlier. We have on the top, we have the stack. On the bottom, we have the heap. Uh, and on the top, we have the control frame structure. And now I'm going to point out there's the self pointer there along with the DFT. Um, and all the same things will happen with the stack. It'll copy the stack out into the heap, and it'll set the DFT pointer to the heap copy. I'm not showing that in this picture, just to keep things simple. But when you call binding, Ruby will also call, uh, it'll also create a new structure called RB underscore binding on the lower right. And in that structure, it'll save the file name and the line number where you call the binding keyword. In case uh, you want to you know, debug something, you can, or if you print out the binding, it'll tell you. Um, but it also creates this thing called env, which points to the same environment structure we saw earlier uh, with the lambda keyword. Except this time, um, what I'm actually showing inside that environment a block structure. So it turns out there's another block structure in the environment. And I'm also showing an additional value here inside the block called self. So when you call binding, it copies not only the DFT from that control frame into the new block, it copies also that self pointer. And the self pointer will point over to the R object, the, to the current value of self. And that's how when I you know, compile that code using eval, it's able to access all the way down on the lower left the at str variable. So what we've seen here is bindings, lambdas, procs, and blocks are all really the same thing. They're all closures, and they're all different ways of looking at the same thing. Um, and I find, you know, I think this is all fascinating. Okay, so, and then just reviewing, you know, going back to our, my original question, what is a block? Now we've seen there's uh, three things in this block structure. 
RB block structure. We have first the I execute instruction sequence that points to the function. We have the DFT, the dyna dynamic frame pointer that points to the referencing environment. And now we have this third thing, which is a self pointer. That points to the R object um, structure, which is the current value of self. So this is really the best definition of, you know, what is a block? And it's also the way, uh, the best, it's the way that Ruby has implemented closures. So in Ruby, the clo cl a closure in Ruby is a function combined with its referencing environment and I guess what you could call the object environment. So the, con the object's context, or the context of, uh, in which they're calling that block. So that's it for today. I'll let you guys go. It's the end of the day. If you like this stuff and you're into Ruby internals, you want to learn more, you know, buy my book, Ruby Under a Microscope, um, and then you'll find it online on my website. Thanks a lot.